Good morning everyone, or is it good evening? Sleep is at the center of the experience of living beings. So before we go to bed, let's talk about the secret sleeper kingdom of the doziest of the dwarves, Verkal Dromak. They are among my favorite stories in this mod and one of the more fun countries to come out of the light and dark expansion. If you did some console shenanigans to check their mission tree, you might have found it barren at first, but worry not, there is so much more in there than meets the eye. Verkal Dromak is the Malachit hold on the easternmost edge of the Dwarven world, overrun by the goblins of the Black Step tribe. The Black Steps are a slave state of the Command, the hobgoblin juggernaut that looms over Rahen and the undisputed final boss of the world of Anbenar. To play as Verkal Dromak, one needs to reform it as a Dwarven adventurer. Challenge accepted. So anyway, you can pick any Dwarven adventure nation in the Serpent Spine, move into a suitable hold and start expanding. Survive, fight and grow. Juggle your factions wisely to your advantage. Restore the old holds and go down your mission tree while aggressively pushing east towards the Tree of Stone and the Jade Mines. I was able as the Asra Expedition to choose a powerful mage as an adventurer heir, which was strange. I don't know what are the requirements to get this option, but I took it immediately. The heir so happened to spawn with legendary necromancy. So I was tempted to go for the gift of lichdom. I mean, why not? I was given this gift. Why shouldn't I keep it? The deed done, my ruler became a lich and my dwarven army was discarded and replaced with a horde of the dead. The main antagonist of the campaign was really the lack of diplomats that the dwarven adventurers suffer from and of course the massive unrest caused by the evils of necromancy. With an army of undead, funded by the richest holds of the Dwarovar, the conquest of the command was merely a chore and I could eventually conquer the hold of Verkaldromak as an adventurer kingdom. Okay, okay, hold up. That's one way to do it, of course, but the fact of the matter is that this approach takes too long and by the time you restore Verkaldromak, it might be already too late in the game. Sure, it's a nice safe way to restore the sleeping kingdom, but let me present an arguably better alternative. This is the continent of Karnor. In the middle of it lies the Holy Roman equivalent of the Empire of Anbenar. The region of Lensenor to the southwest is dominated by the undisputed splendor of Laurent and its wine-fueled knight armies. Among humans, elves, hobbits and half-elves, a dwarven hold proudly stands in the Ruby Mountains. The trick to reform the Sleeping Kingdom lies in the halls of Rubyhold. Laurent is the France equivalent of the world of Van Benar, and I find it fairly uninteresting as a country. It starts in a strong position with an unruly swarm of vassals. Across the world there are countless adventurers ready to set out into the unknown and claim lands in the name of whatever cause they have. These adventures are represented by events that trigger from countries that control certain key provinces. More notable examples are the Vanbury Guild adventure band that spawns in Elentir from Telgeir or the Jaherian exemplars that spawn from Elisna, which are interesting nations to play in their own right. If you control the respective province around certain dates, you may choose to switch to the newly birthed nation or keep playing as your original one. Many such adventure kingdoms are not fleshed out, but there are plenty of them, and some are. Controlling Ruby Hold will spawn two dwarven adventure kingdoms in the Serpent Spine. You can start as Laurent and conquer Ruby Hold, or play as the dwarves themselves, it doesn't really matter that much. What is most important is to keep up with technology and ideas. Everything else is irrelevant. Around the year 1460, the company of grudge bearers will leave Rubyhold and spawn in the middle Dwarovar between Sigdir and Verkalgulan. They are closer than any other adventurers, but they're not where we want to be, so we acknowledge the fact that they exist and move on. Ten years later though, the Axbello cartel will spawn in the Tree of Stone. This is the nation that we want to switch to. I was inspired originally by a reddit poster named Kvernakus, and I decided to try this approach myself. Spoiler alert, it works. Also a word of advice, be prepared to save and load games. This can and has been done without cheating, but the first quarter of the campaign can be quite volatile. Axe Bello Cartel starts next to the hold of Huz Al Krakazol. It is tempting to move in and start expanding from there. When moving into the hold, we also get a nice event which creates an alliance with the neighboring kingdom, otherwise impossible for a serpent spine adventurer. This is a bad idea in many many ways. The command is a monstrous hobgoblin state with one of the best armies in the world and one of the most powerful militaries. 
Hobgoblin military grants constant army professionalism, which translates to infinite manpower, among other great military bonuses that the command has. The Raheni are constantly bullied by the command and you will only get crushed under the weight of wars that you do not want to be part of. Instead, migrate along the Dwarven track to the north until you meet the slave state of Stolen Gem. Now, how can you defeat the command as one broad province Dwarven miner, you say? Well, there is the Dwarven Adventure buff that lasts for 30 years, which grants you extra land force limit, 30% army morale, and together with adventuring efficiency makes army maintenance almost inexistent. On top of that, you get sufficient manpower. The siege ability of the Dwarven military is also a great advantage, together with the fact that the one province that you own is very defensible. Spawning the Axe Bellow Cartel, aside from the awesome flag, grants enough money to build a fort and a rampart from the get-go and free infantry units. Build up your forces to the limit and hire the one mercenary company as well. Keep an eye on Stolen Gem and notice when the command goes to war against their neighbors. Preferably a war that contains the Denijan Rush. Obviously, you want the command's 100,000 men army to be distracted when you declare the anti-monstrous conquest war against them. Once again, our insignificance is our strength in the early game. This is a show superiority type of war, so you can score as many victories as you can, while taking as many forts as you can. The Black Steps and the Stolen Gems are easy to win fights against, but the Hobgoblins of the command will be more of a challenge. Also keep in mind that their manpower will never be drained, so you need to siege down forts and do your best to keep them from your enemy's hands. After my first war I have managed to conquer all the way up to and including the hold of Burdus Andris, and immediately started expelling Hobgoblins and Goblins from my land, a promising first step. From now on though, it will only become increasingly dangerous. The command might be distracted by further wars in the Rahen, but be sure that they will focus on reconquering their lost lands. As soon as truce is over, war is inevitable. Take the initiative and declare your wars instead of having to rely on fighting reconquest wars. Be prepared. Fort up. The more lands you will conquer, the harder the wars will be. No matter how much you take, the command does not seem to get any weaker. Try and annex their slave states if you have enough war score. That should significantly lower their overall force limit, but it doesn't make them any less dangerous. From the second war, I managed to take the prize, Verkal Dromak. Unfortunately, the wonderful Dwarven buff that we started with should expire during the truce after this war. Also, due to monetary and security reasons, we could not colonize too much in the meantime. As nice as the adventure mission tree can be, it is a good idea to take the decision to restore Verkal Dromak as soon as possible after the second war. If you need a year or two to finish some missions, go ahead, but I suggest doing it as soon as possible. The reason is, you need allies and as an adventurer you do not have this option. Steal maps until you can see the Raj and improve relations, cast magnificent feasts and do all that you can to secure an alliance with them. This will not stop the command from attacking, but your allies might prove to be a valuable distraction. In my case, the third war was the most difficult, and the fourth one was no walk in the park either. The more land you have to lose, the worse it is, and losing the adventure buff was immediately felt. Taking lands in the next few wars is also very expensive after reforming the nation, due to the 50% administrative efficiency debuff that lasts for 50 years. Okay, so you founded Verkal Dromak. Good job. Let's take a look at its particularities as a state. As mentioned before, it's a Malachit Dwarf Hold with Dwarven Army and Administration and you do have the potential to switch to Hobgoblin Military. Your religious situation will be Ancestor Worship of course, which we talked about before. The national ideas are quite bad, not gonna lie. You will need to switch to Dromaki ideas in order to complete the whole mission tree though. Let's take a look. You get 4 defense of course, 10% infantry combat ability, minor unrest decrease and that's about all that is relevant. You get some attrition for enemies which is useless against the command and generally meh. 
an insignificant 2.5% or power cost reduction because we're mages, extra power projection from insults, 10,000 sailors and marine force limit, and some decent spy network bonuses. Wait, what? Sailors? In the mountains? Yes, sailors and marines. You can start seeing the madness within this nation already. Marine regiments consume sailors instead of manpower, but they are only useful for a mission in the later mission tree and might be okay peacekeepers but they're not a substitute for frontline manpower due to the extremely slow sailor recovery the dwarves experience but just that the fact that this exists makes it so interesting and creative i genuinely love this concept otherwise their government is a kingdom so they lose all government progress gained as an adventurer make sure to buy all the government capacity as you can before forming verkal dromak not to waste the extra reform progress a piece of friendly advice, try not to give the mage's estate any privileges that grant them too much influence. What will become immediately obvious is that our population seems to be very erratic and almost insane in comparison to any other. There will be different bad pulsing events, street fights that will cause devastation and loss of development in road provinces, diplomatic faux pas events where the opinions of various countries about us will be damaged. If any of these diplomatic events ruin the opinions of nations that we aim to ally, it can spell a game over in the early parts of the campaign. All of these pulsing events will be addressed in time, but until then we must have to live with the childish behavior of our own population. If we take a look at the mission tree, we only see a small handful. Don't worry, there is much more in there than meets the eye. What I mean is that most of it is hidden at the beginning and will gradually unravel in time. We start with some relatively basic expansion and digging missions and of course, as any other dwarf, we will focus on digging and upgrading our holds and expanding into the serpent spine, in our case specifically into the jade mines and tree of stone, our immediate vicinity. I would rather conquer and hold all the lands personally, due to the coring cost reduction offered by the permanent claims in the region. The mountains beyond will create a historical bond of friendship with any dwarven nation bordering you and offer some well-deserved economic bonuses. The Hall of the Medic, School of Diplomats and Durable Construction Missions will mitigate the bad effects of the previously mentioned Pulsic events, but they require a substantial amount of digging and development so they are a future project. Upgrading our capital hold will grant us increased defensiveness. Aside from being a country of sleeping child dwarves, Verkaldromak is a nation of wizards, and the otherworldly architecture developed by our people will culminate in an impregnable fortress with a 100% defensiveness bonus on top of all the regular dwarven ones, making it a place where you can truly sleep soundly no matter the outside threat. The evolution of Maze's mission, though, is bugged, as no modifiers have been added to any of my holds when completing that one. The real fun starts once you give the mages the space and infrastructure to investigate the hidden altar found in the depths of the hold. Finishing the channeling tower mission will spark a series of events that are central to the identity and fun of the sleeping kingdom. After the strange altar is restored and the mage tower is constructed, the mages guild become more and more of a threat to a group called the sleepers. No matter the route that we take, a conflict between the crown and the mages erupts with the clergy and nobility supporting them. This gives the mages a lot of influence while really damaging the relations with them, the nobles and the clergy. Tensions rise quickly until the expulsion of mages disaster fires, because life in the serpent spine is a never-ending struggle against an unending chain of disasters. This disaster is very dangerous and should hopefully occur while sufficiently shielded against the command aggression with a large enough force limit between us and our allies. The ongoing effects will be a 20% penalty for all power costs and a 10% army morale reduction. The disaster is completed once the mage's estate is completely removed. The massive influence gain prior to the disaster will be impossible to overcome by conventional means. Occasionally, mage rebels will spawn more and more stacks over time. These are unique rebels in a sense in which, when they conquer provinces, they also steal a bit of mana from your power pool, five of each to be precise. Try to spread out your armies so that they can be taken out quickly. Pulsing events will fire that will gradually increase power costs and damage your province's development, especially in holds, which is very painful. But these events will also lower mage influence. The way to victory lies in using the kill all mages debuff from these events to lower the mages influence to zero. The problem with this debuff is that it has a relatively short duration and you may run the risk of it expiring which means you must start all over again. 
My suggestion is to be ready to load the game if the debuff expires, otherwise the disaster is too damaging to the campaign. Once the mages are removed and order is restored, the estate is replaced by the sleepers, which is in all mechanical aspects identical to the mages. If we take a look at the mission tree though now, we will notice that it has expanded and the Sleeper Research 1 mission is available. This is where we start harnessing the magic of dreams and bring them to our reality for different marvelous effects. Researching sleep will demand some mana and will increase power cost for 10 years, so it's best done when we're not planning for any major expansions or technological advancement. It's a time of rest and relaxation. Well, relatively speaking, for the command is still there and there's a horrible threat. When our ruler sleeps, our army fights and the fourth war against the command was declared soon after the mage kill disaster. The fourth war was also a very difficult one and our Raj allies were now more than a speed bump in the way of the hobgoblin hordes. This was one of the more difficult wars against them, characterized by a decent amount of saves coming to avoid an early end. It was enough to secure the rest of the Jade Mines though. Soon enough, we managed to gather sufficient cash to trigger the Horde Curse. My income at the time was around 100 Ducats monthly, which was not ideal, but it had to do. I successfully ended the Horde Curse with only a few loans and it was a good time to research better sleep. There are 5 sleeper research technologies in total and each of them unlocks a set of dream missions which our ruler can materialize for different strange benefits. Of course, the higher the sleeper research, the more advanced and impactful dreams are unlocked. I will talk about them each and how they impacted my campaign a bit later. Sometime after the sleepers formed their own guild, they suggest that the king, the first servant of the people, should have all the power, including the power of magic. Thus, the sleeper Gothric the Mad steps up and is installed as an heir. Gothric is a 666 powerful mage. So why not? Why not just keep him? I don't think there's any reason not to. I can't see anything bad happening with a 666 powerful mage heir that cannot be removed. The former adventurer captain and now king, Odun I, has served his people better than anyone could have hoped for. One day, while inspecting his hold, an unfortunate construction accident prematurely ended his life. A block of marble that fell from a crane has sparked a wave of grief through the halls of Verkaldromak, and the new king, Gothric, declared a week of mourning. Soon after, suspicion starts to overtake grief. Was it an accident? How could this have happened? The new king is tasked to commence an investigation. If it was foul play, it is clear that the jealous and bitter mages must have conspired against the king. But was it foul play or simply an accident? We might never find out. By pure coincidence and bad luck, the investigator tasked with uncovering the mystery disappears as well, never to be seen or heard from again. What a shame. All in all, the sleepers gain more strength to the detriment of the old estates and the new government is eventually installed the sleeper government. This tier 1 reform lowers all power costs by 1% and guarantee a powerful mage on ruler's death with a choice given of 3 candidates with various decent stat combinations. One downside of this government is the fact that rulers cannot be made generals, so no powerful mages on the field unfortunately. To compensate I tried using the battle mage academy's privilege. This was a bit underwhelming as in 200 years I have only been offered 2 mage generals who both had very short lifespans. Nevertheless, eventually everyone went for their midday naps and completely forgot that anything ever happened, with the only permanent result being the position of power modifier which grants a permanent plus to global unrest and minus 10% influence for all non-magic estates. The dream missions are the bread and butter of this though. The first research unlocks two dreams. At first, the king thinks this is one of his more boring dreams. A single hue filling their vision, with the occasional shift of tone or light, but little else. A lovely hue, orange-yellow, but a monochromatic vision is not what Gotrek I expects when he lays down to slumber. Then finally, motion. A moving out, a moving away. Finally, there is more than just the color and it's put in context. There is a sea of color in a vast chamber. 
further out faster. The sea is a size to boggle the mind. And there at the corner of the chamber are those dwarfs? Quickly the vision approaches them, in an accented tongue. Gothric I makes out only a handful of words. Expanding the citadel delf before he snaps awake. For a few more moments the king lays in bed. He has seen what must be the inside of Verkal Gulan, its amassed fortune. And Gotrek I knows he may never see a sight to rival its wealth again, for all the years remaining. This mission simply gifts us 80 points of spine network on whomever controls Verkal Gulan and then adds one gold resource randomly in one of our provinces. Easy. Next to the dream of gold, there is a dream about fighting, where Gotrek I sees somebody breaking his prized vase. This clear insult is a cause for war. This dream is more interesting. During our breakout into the world, we have befriended the nation of Segdir, and through the mission The Mountains Beyond, we have made them a historical and loyal friend. Dreaming of conflict will result in a war declaration against that very historical friend with a subjugation casus belli. This is potentially very powerful and aided us in locking down almost the complete middle Dwarovar in one war while keeping a claim on all of their provinces. On our second tier, we get three new dreams. We dream about goblins. Goblins are everywhere. We hate them. This reminds us how much we hate goblins and as an effect lowers goblin tolerance for each dwarven nation in the world with a small bonus of culture conversion cost. Next, we dream about development. Architecture in marble, granite and more. Malachit cut in every shape known to dwarf casting rainbow patterns in the torchlight. The thrum of dwarves at work, making the hold even better. Gotrek I has walked these halls and seen these in the light of day, but it all seems super saturated in his dream tonight, infused with a splendor that must rival the height of Aldwarov. He smiles in his sleep, proud of what the hold has become, long removed from the days of goblin squatters. Turning into another corridor, the tapestries on the wall depict the hall's glorious reconquest. Descending a spiral stairway, following a line of glowing malachite along the wall, opening a door of solid Gankenden oak. And then, darkness, horror, death, terror, pain. It comes too quick to know the details, but as he awakes with a start, the king knows the grim truth. Somewhere amidst the resplendent hold, there lurks a devouring darkness, and it is waiting. This one will downgrade our capital hold by one, but will also grant a permanent modifier to the province, where local development and construction are both bolstered by 20%, which is a bonus that greatly compensates for the unfortunate drawback. We dream about mountains. The dream begins with a flat vista, empty, featureless. Then. Above it, the sun begins to move across the sky, faster, faster, until it blurs and in a blink, hundreds if not thousands of years pass, faster still, moving into million years. And where there was a flat vista, suddenly there is a growing range, the earth being thrust sky high. Hills, then mountains, then towering peaks, massive edifices carved with caverns, whatever this dream is of, there are no roads, no holds, not yet. And in those caverns, what will I see there? A question for another night. But I am left with a vision and a desire to see these oft-overlooked caves in the flesh. This one will assign the Cavern of Interest modifier to three random provinces, allowing us to exploit them whenever we choose. The third tier unlocks more complex dreams and it starts a conversation about better planned working hours in our state to allow the citizens for more sleep. More sleep will grant a minus two global unrest buff, which essentially counteracts the position of power debuff at the cost of 20% tax. Worry not, for as time goes by, people adjust to the new schedule and discover the benefits of extra rest, production is eventually also permanently increased by 20%. The more sleep mission is a strange one. It unlocks a final government change, the tier 2 sleeper monarch reform. This causes our monarch to sleep for half a year each year. 
This creates a weird cadence in which while the monarch is sleeping, our army morale and taxes suffer, but when he awakes, we get a discipline bonus and another random one. It's almost impossible to keep track and manage the buffs and debuffs correctly, and if you choose to ignore the messages related to the ruler going to sleep and waking up, you will never see them again and thus have to check the bonuses from time to time. It's tedious and weird, but this whole nation is, so why not? On tier 3, we dream about other dwarves. An elderly dwarf artisan claims to have discovered a method to open a portal to a strange land in which, allegedly, reside a number of dwarves who the dwarf claims to have seen in dreams. As unbelievable as it may seem, he further claims that he just needs a few ingredients and some manpower to develop such a connection. Luckily, most of these ingredients are available in local markets. All he needs is a bit of gold if we wish to explore this. This dream allows you to undertake a project to open a portal to a distant hold. In my case, it was Durva Jatun, on the northern edge of the Serpent's Spine. It seems like the small mission chain is incomplete, as after the preparation is completed and the portal is opened, one of our armies is teleported next to Durva Jatun. The tooltip announces that we declare teleportation war on the owner of the destination hold, but nothing happens and our army is now black flagged in foreign territory. Nevertheless, completing the permanent connection mission will grant us core on that province, so we are free to attack Orlazam as Deer and expand from our new core into Almdir and the Serpent's Veil. We can then dream about our hold. The sleeper's consciousness wades through the fabric of dreams. This time, through shifting hues that seem to speak words of their own and mesmerizingly flow to form grand worlds. During this delve, however, he has also felt an entity's gaze, not uncommon for those that delve the world of dreams, though its close attention today is alarming. Alas for the sleeper, they have been followed and hovered about many times, for years even. Each chance encounter, the Watcher would confine the sleeper in the world of dreams for what seemed like an eternity. The sleeper felt the entity's gaze lift from him for a moment, observing his dream world with ravenous curiosity. The sleeper felt it move, reaching towards a floating dream, crushing and remaking it into fleshy sands that wriggle with overflowing life and hostility. The sands then congregate to be undone and remade once again into perverted dreams of perfection. This time of his friends and loved ones beckoning to him to join them in a feast. A dream he had seen countless times as many others did and upon that thought all the food and person melt into squelching sands that slither away back into the dark confines of the dream. The success only makes the sleeper groan as he again anticipates in the near future the countless petty tricks the entity would throw again and again with seemingly no reason but to annoy him. Another one of the wriggling tentacles attempted to slither into the darkness of his mind. Another one of the tricks of the entity that he has already gotten tired of squashing. This time, however, the entity suddenly tugged on his mind with forcefulness far beyond its previous efforts. A void slowly devours the dream world and the entity's presence creeps closer and closer. Even knowing it is but a dream, the sleeper does not look at it, does not envision it, but it nonetheless approaches him. As much as the dreamer tries to hold fast, his eyes involuntarily flicker towards the motion and sound of the approaching water looming before him. It is not complacency that breaks the sleeper, no. It is simply time that has ground down on him. Time and its endless tricks breaking him. Horror fills him as the wriggling flesh from before swarms his now defenseless mind. It invades every corner and every thought as they move with ravenous curiosity. The sleeper screamed with his eyes still shut. He screamed for what seemed to be ages across the void. Suddenly he felt the wriggling flesh stop and the entity move. Vaguely he saw what seemed to be its mouth move. It spoke a single word with feelings of joy, longing, wonder, admiration and a desolate and ephemeral beauty. Death. The sleeper opened his eyes to see and all he saw was the entity staring straight into his soul and he saw it all. The sleeper saw visions of carnage, slaughter and chaos by otherworldly creatures that hide in plain sight across Halan. They will awaken from their slumber and come, all of them, and then the world will return from whence it came. Through one his glimpses, however, he saw a creature that slumbered beneath the depths of their hold. 
a creature with eight enormous and slimy tentacles that stretch further into the dark caves with a head bearing an enormous maw lined with countless teeth double the size of an adult dwarf. The sleeper? No, the High King of Verkal Dromak awoke from what seemed ages of sleep and immediately shouted for his closest aid to come, commanding him to call all of the clans and the finest adventurers across Dwarovar. There can be no effort wasted for this, and even all the preparations of their supposedly mad ancestors are far from enough. He has been burdened by this knowledge, and by the ancestors he will do whatever it takes to slay the creature. Well now, this is truly broken, I think. This dream unlocks the Kraken Expedition mission. This one requires us to have at least five marines and get ready to send them to explore the depths of the mountain and find the monster in the dream. You can gather maps, charms, tools and prayers. The complete set of preparations cost a total of 60,000 ducats, which is a lot to pay at once. A team of 150 strong is sent to hunt the Kraken. This starts a chain of events that plays like a choose-your-own-adventure type of game. In my experience, no matter what I chose, I end up having my party run out of people and morale. The in-state influence debuffs from the preparation stay permanently and there is no conclusion if the party is wiped out. Even though this mission tree is one that requires our marines, this one at this stage is completely broken, unfortunately. The dream about our ancestors is a simple dream which results in us being able to upgrade the earth seed altar with a permanent plus two tolerance of the true faith. The fourth tier of research unlocks the most powerful dreams yet. We dream about immortality. The dreams of the tower continue, colored by a far darker presence than before. The tower has reached its peak but so too has the wickedness that diffuses from it. A great horde of undead seeps from its base, but are held back by a lone figure in tattered black robes standing upon a balcony gazing down. A witch king. As they stare down upon their new subjects, their gaze slowly drifts towards the dreamer, though their face is covered by a fragmented ebony mask, fractured by lines and shaped in an endless scream, the dreamer can feel their eyes meet and with such a meeting comes great knowledge. This dreams allows us to study immortal liches or vampires. The results of our studies can have two consequences. One is an immediate upgrade of our necromancy level which may allow us to more quickly attain lichdom, while another one is a permanent plus 10 maximum absolutism bonus. The absolutism bonus, ironically named ban of necromancy, does not actually really affect our necromancy studies at all, so it's simply superior in my opinion. In my playthrough, Gotrek the Mad was immediately labeled as a Witch King, even with a mere proficient level of necromancy. So I simply researched this magic until legendary status and achieved Lichdom by conventional means. Becoming a Lich will also allow us to change government to a Magocracy. I did not switch, but it might be worth it due to the fact that the Sleeper government does not allow rulers to be generals. We can dream about the world. And so we dream about various conquerors that subjugated the world and then each of them was assassinated. This dream grants permanent claims on all of the dwarven holds in the world. Once we own the whole world by conquering all the holds in the serpent spine, we are also assassinated. But we are rewarded with a permanent 10% administrative efficiency, which is massive. Being a lich, the assassination only had the effect of our stats being slightly damaged, but they can be recovered in time. We can dream about magic. This mission opens up a small mission branch that has the dwarves build up instead of digging further down. The projects erect a strange and mysterious mage tower, which in its final form reduces overall power cost by 10%, with the exception of technologies, and grants a local unrest and minus one monthly admin power penalty. There are strange sounds coming from the mage tower replica, and there does not seem to be any follow-up to that. We can also dream about the meaning of life. 42. It's 42. More than a mere Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy reference, this mission will lower all power costs by 42% for 42 days. This is massive. 
I've done a trick where I casted the legendary divination spell for sight right before taking this mission to achieve a higher than 100% all power costs and see what I can do with it. Well, long story short, it's not super impressive. You cannot use it to cheese development or get any technologies ridiculously ahead of time, for the power cost reduction is additive and not multiplicative. The most you can get out of this, perhaps, is to boost your mercantilism or professionalism through buying generals very cheaply and to fill up idea sets, or even replacing ones that you already have with new ones essentially for free. Idea cost is floored at 40 power points, and removing an idea set will restore 40 points per idea bot, so I, I used it for that. One other thing, this power reduction bonus will make annexing vassals almost instant, as the points necessary to annex them will be severely reduced. So I took this opportunity to finally annex Sigdir, which was otherwise extremely slow due to the diplomatic reputation malice of being a witch king. There might be some other hidden benefits that I did not think of, and it's very fun to play around with the idea that there is a way to reach more than 100% power cost reduction using this mission, which is a, a thing very unique to Verkaldromak. The last year of Sleeper Research looks unremarkable at first, but after a few years following the start of the mission, it is made clear that something is wrong, and a special relic is required for disaster to be averted. You are then tasked to find that relic. You need many free diplomats, and the spy network construction bonuses in our ideas will help a bit. The task is to either befriend or have a high spy network in various countries which control a precursor relic resource. Once their opinion of us, in case of colonial countries for example, or our spy network in their lands reaches 80, we can choose a decision to respectively steal or buy the relic from them. The chance for them to actually have our needed relic is very very small, and it will take a lot of tries to find it. This one is again a bit strange, for if the research ends without us finding the relic, then we will simply fail the final research. If we do succeed in finding the relic, it in itself will grant a bonus of minus 0.5 unrest, but the final mission is unlocked, and we succeed. The success message was one of the most fun revelations of this game and I will not spoil it for you. I hope you will get to discover the pinnacle of sleep research by yourself. Nevertheless, the final bonuses are well worth the trouble. Precursor relics will be installed in the capital hold of Verkaldromak, together with a local goods produced bonus alongside a permanent 5% power cost decrease and one monthly diplomatic power. Absolutely sweet. The only problem is that the precursor relics are not permanent. Overall, even with the currently present bugs and hiccups, Verkaldromak is a lot of fun. Not very beginner friendly for sure, but if you're looking for a challenge, this is it. Terribly difficult to form, the result is very much worth it. As compensation, you are guaranteed a 666 powerful mage, a 10% administrative efficiency bonus, which allows for unusually large conquests in the late game, and a lot of power reduction after the disaster and all the sleeper research is complete. Great story, great mechanics, interesting color. The beauty of the Dream missions, aside from their creativity, is their overall flexibility. You can choose to use them to your advantage in whatever context you find yourself in. Aside from conquering the Serpent Spine, which is something you want to do as a dwarf anyway, you're not really railroaded into any direction, so you can choose to adapt and use the Dream Mission rewards as you wish. For ideas, I had to start with quantity, to begin to hope that after the Third War I could prevent the command from attacking me again. The second idea was economic, of course, an almost mandatory choice for dwarves. I chose influence as the third one due to the fact that you get to secure a very large vassal through missions, and I shortly had one extra vassal as a human shield against the command, before I could comfortably fight them one to one. After influence, I went for offensive to get the sweet, sweet siege bonus. In principle, you get some extra tolerance of the true faith with Verkaldromak, so I, I tried my hand at religious for more conversion power, but converting to ancestor worship using missionaries is unfortunately very slow overall, so humanist might simply be a more practical choice instead. I chose not to reform the Aldwarov for flavor, but the Aldwarov ideas are vastly superior to Verkaldromak's, and if you want to do a more conquest-oriented campaign, then switching to the Dwarven Empire is a very solid choice, because it will keep your missions as they are. You do lose your innate marine bonus, but if you build five of them and just keep them safe until later when you want to try the expedition mission, you can always do that. Or take maritime ideas, why not? 
crazier things have happened in the Sleeping Kingdom. <laughs>